Welcome to another video on the I Get Chem channel where we help you learn chemistry the easy way by showing you how to do problems. This is another video in our quantum chemistry series and uh, this uh, question is about the angular momentum operators and their commutation relationships. So first of all, let me first say this uh, video is going to be uh, a little long because there's just a lot of math involved. Um, however, uh, even though you might be tempted to skip this problem or this video, this is probably one of the problems that you wish you had not skipped. Um, as I've said, I picked these problems from an old book that I used to have in college. and. Um, so I'm going to use these problems from this book to illustrate some of the key ideas behind quantum mechanics. Uh, your book would obviously have different problems, but I think the same problem probably shows up in every single book in, um, on quantum mechanics. So uh, let's take a look at this question. So let me read the question first. The operators for the components of angular momentum are mx equals to minus ih bar parentheses y partial partial z minus z partial partial y <coughs> my equals to minus i h bar parentheses z partial partial x minus x partial partial z and finally mz is equal to minus i h bar parentheses x partial partial y minus y times partial partial x uh, show that mx my minus my mx is equal to ih bar mz and that m square mz is equal to mz m squared in which m squared is defined as mx squared plus my squared plus mz squared. And then after that, then derive the corresponding commutation rules for my and mz, for mz and mx, and also for m squared with mx and with my. So you can see why this is going to be a fairly long solution. Okay, so let's take a look at the problem. The reason why this is a important problem is because these uh, angular momentum operators show up quite a bit in chemistry. So you would definitely want to understand where what these uh, angular momentum operators are and furthermore their commutation relationships are important. So let's get uh, started. So in the first part, let me write down what I want. So I'll just call that part A, even though there are no A's and B's in this problem. In the first part, it's asking you to calculate this quantity, mx, my, minus my, mx. So uh, in the, an earlier video, we talked about these commutators. And in fact, you see that this, uh, this expression is really the commutator between mx and my. So using that commutator notation, which is indicated by brackets, square brackets, this is defined as really mx comma my commutator. Okay, so that's a, essentially a definition. So what we want to do is to use the operators for mx and my that's specified in the problem uh, to try to write down this commutator. So um, you can always pause the video and scroll back to the beginning to look at the uh, statement of the problem where the definition of the MX, MY, and MZ operators um, are. So, but let's take a look at um, these two terms. So in order to calculate the commutator between MX and MY, we have to essentially take each of those two terms and really work out what it is uh, using the definition of the uh, angular momentum operators. So let's do the first one first. I'm going to call the first one just I so that I don't have to write it too many times or the first one is Roman numeral one and the second one Roman numeral two. So I'm going to first 
work out what Roman numeral 1 is. So that's MX, then MY. And now I am going to use the definitions of MX and MY and write that down. So uh, MX is minus IH bar times Y partial partial Z minus Z partial partial Y. And MY is minus IH bar times Z partial partial X minus X partial partial Z. So that's really what 1 is. Uh, of course, what I need to do is to basically expand it, just basically multiply out all the terms. So let me do that on the next line. So this is equal to, there are two factors of I minus I H bar. So I can group those together and just write the square. And now I'm going to have then four terms because there are basically two terms in each of the brackets. If you multiply everything out, you will get four terms. So let me put that in a set of square, square brackets. Furthermore, I'm going to use different colors for these because later on I want to uh, basically uh, use a different color for each term. So at least you can see them a little easier on the page. So the first term is obtained by basically this with that. So let me switch to that color. Um, so what that would give you is Y partial partial Z and then Z partial partial X. So that's the first term. And now the second term I would um, get by having this with that. And so notice that there is a minus sign in that term. So Y partial partial Z and then we have X partial partial Z. And now the third term we will get by having this go with that. And notice again that there is a minus sign. So Z partial partial Y and Z partial partial X. And finally, the last term is obtained by having this go with that and uh, the double minus becomes a positive. So I have a positive Z partial partial Y, uh, X partial partial Z. And that all goes inside this square brackets. So we will have to uh, find a simplification of that thing to try to uh, make a better sense of it. Uh, as I've said in the previous video, sometimes these operator equations look a little strange because they're lacking a function that the operator operates on. Sometimes, uh, so sometimes you may actually find it useful to actually reinsert the function that the operator is supposed to operate on so that at least when you do the derivatives, you, it it's, uh, makes a little bit more sense visually. So what I'm going to do is to basically uh, have this operate on this function, which I will call f. So I'm going to apply this operator to a function f. So obviously, if you apply the right side of this expression to a function f, then it's really basically taking that f and then writing it there, right? So each of the four terms now actually explicitly has this function f in it. And after I finish everything, I group everything together and separate out the f at the end, and that will give me the operator formal form of the of um, this operator Roman numeral I. Okay, so now I am going to take a look at each term. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one. Um, so you can basically see that this partial derivative, partial partial z, applies to whichever is inside the parentheses. So in order to simplify that term what I will have to do is to use the product rule to apply partial partial z to the product z and partial f partial x. So I can do that pretty easily. The first term will give me partial z partial z, which is 1, multiplied by partial f partial x, so that that's left. 
and then the second term in the product rule will give me z times partial squared f partial z partial x. So that is the first term uh, written out. And now I'll do the same for each of the other terms. So this one, when you write that out, so I'm going to be careful with the minus sign on the outside. Again, using the product rule. The first one will give you partial x partial z. Let me just write that one out. Multiplied by partial f partial z. And then, and then the second term in the, uh, in the parentheses would be uh, x multiplied by partial square f partial z partial z. Or I can write that as partial z squared. Now at this point, you see that partial x partial z is actually 0. So that term drops out. And because 0 multiplied by anything is 0, so there's really only one term in the this, in, in this second um, uh, term in the, in the whole thing. Okay, so, so the screen is eventually just minus y times x partial squared f partial z squared. Okay, now I'll work on the other terms. So this one is next. Again, remembering the minus sign in front of it, minus z. Again, applying the uh, product rule to the, the derivative, um, we have partial z, partial y, and then partial f, partial x, and then um, I have a z uh, times partial squared f, partial y, partial x. Again, this partial z, partial y is 0. So the first term of that, uh, again, just like the last term, uh, will drop out. Finally, the last one in violet uh, plus z. And product rule, again, partial x, partial y, partial f, partial z, plus x, partial square f, partial y partial z okay so those are the four terms worked out so remember i am going to uh cross out the terms which are going oh so one more thing before i go on again this term partial x partial y will give you zero so i'm going to cross out the terms which are going to give me zero so zero 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 uh, so those are the terms that are actually left. And now I can group them. So you see in the result, so there is a minus ih bar squared in front, square brackets. Uh, in the result, you see that there are terms that involve only the first derivative of f. And there is this one right there. So that term is y times partial f, partial x. And the other terms uh, all contain uh, second partial derivatives of f. So I'll just write that out. So the next one would be um, y times this one. So yz partial square f, partial z, partial x. The next one would be minus y times x partial f partial square f partial z squared minus y x and then the next one will be this one so that's uh, minus z squared partial square f is partial y partial x and then finally this last one uh, z x partial square f, partial y, partial z. Okay, so the uh, math are, is basically just tedious, uh, not very challenging. You just have to really keep track of everything carefully. So to just remind myself, what I have just got is the operator Roman numeral 1 applied to this function f 
gives me these partial derivatives. So let me rewrite this one in that color, just right over the f's. Okay, so that's basically what the operator Roman numeral, numeral 1 does to the function f. Okay, so I've just got that term. Now I have to do the same thing with the other term. So you just basically repeat the exercise. So I'm going to try to write out everything, but I'll just do it a little faster without talking as much. Okay, so again, Roman numeral 2 applied to function f is now equal to um, m y m x operated on f and you see that this is minus i h bar squared uh, z partial partial x minus x partial partial z and uh, y partial partial z minus z partial partial y and that's uh, operated on function f again you expand so you take that and write out the four terms again square brackets uh, so you get z partial partial x multiplied by y partial partial z. The second term is z partial partial x on z partial partial y. And now the third term is minus x partial partial z y partial partial z and finally we have plus x partial partial z z partial partial y and that's applied to f so I can take this f again and put it in there so f goes there there there, there. And now I can do the same type of uh, product rule as I have done. And if you do that, you will see that. Let me just write out everything now without color coding. So at the end, you see that this is just minus i h bar squared. Uh, you will get a z y partial squared f partial x partial z. Uh, minus z squared partial square f partial x partial y and each of these corresponds to the term above this one is y x partial square f partial z squared and finally we have two terms x times partial f partial y plus z partial square f partial z partial y okay so actually let me move this term a little to the right so you see how that corresponds to the term above okay so again there are five terms as you have uh, in the above so let me again group together first of all take the term that involves the only the first derivative of f and write it at the beginning which is that term and then the rest are basically a z y partial square f partial x partial z minus z squared partial square f partial x partial y minus xy partial square f partial z squared and finally plus xz partial square f partial z partial y and that's it okay so again let me remind myself this is operator roman numeral 2 
operating on the function f. So this function f is there, 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 and there. Okay, now I want the commutator between 1 and 2. So you see what I really want is Roman numeral 1 minus Roman numeral 2. So what I really want is to write down this function, which I'll use. Uh, so Roman numeral 1 minus Roman numeral 2 is what I want. Uh, so I have these multiplied by function f. So I'm going to pick out the terms I need from these two equations. So let me scroll up a little bit just to show you the Roman numeral 1 operating on f. So that's exactly that. And then Roman numeral 2 operating on f, which is the second equation in yellow. Okay, so I will have to take the difference between the top equation and the bottom equation. So what I mean by that is I have to take this equation and subtract from that this equation. So at this point you can sort of see that there are some common terms but they have different signs so we can cancel them out and so you have to do that carefully but if you do that carefully you can basically get um, the final result which comes out to be fairly simple. Now remember that you're looking at 1 minus 2 so the terms are common between the top equation in white and the bottom equation in yellow. Those are the terms that actually cancel out, right? So I'm looking for terms that are actually the same in both equations because subtracting the second from the first, those terms will drop out. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, you see that there is a yz, partial square f, partial z, partial x, and there is this term. Uh, you see this one is a partial derivative with z first and, and x second, but this one is x first and z second, but the order of the partial derivative doesn't make any difference because you get the same partial derivative either, either way. So these two terms are common, and so if you subtract 2 from 1, that term will drop out. And now you can see that basically all the terms that involve the second derivatives of f are exactly like that. So for example, the second one right there is common with that one. This uh, third one that involves the double derivative of f is uh, going to drop out with that one. And finally, this one is going to drop out with that one. You see the reason why we separated the terms that only contain the first derivative of f is because those are finally the terms that remain if you take 1 and subtract from that 2. So finally, we see that 1 minus 2 operating, operate, operated on f essentially just gives you uh, two terms. So it's minus i h bar squared, which is still there, and then the two terms that remain are y partial x uh, partial partial x minus x partial partial y and now i'm going to essentially just take out the f and put it at the end right so basically what that means is that in operator form the commutator 1 minus 2 is just given by that operator okay so Finally, one last thing to do. So if you look at that, you see that whichever is there is just the negative of mz because mz is defined as minus i h bar times x partial partial x minus y partial partial, whoops, sorry x partial partial y, y partial partial x. So that's a definition for mz. So you see that whichever is here is the negative of that. So you take out one negative so you can easily see that whichever remains is just i h bar multiplied by mz 
operated on F. So now again, you take out this F from both sides. So you see that in operator form, the correct answer for the commutator MX, MY, which is this Roman numeral one, Y minus Roman numeral two, is just I H bar times MZ. So that is the result that we want in the first part of the problem. Okay, now the problem is not done, but I promise you it will get a little easier in the second part. So let me just scroll up. So in the second part, what you want to do is to prove a different identity. And what you need to prove is that uh, m squared mz is equal to mz m squared where m squared is defined as mx squared plus my squared plus mz squared. So it's like um, this is the, um, the equivalent in uh, three-dimensional vectors where you have a, um, where you have the um, absolute magnitude square of the three x, y, z components of a vector. But these are not vectors, these are operators, but formally m squared is defined as the uh, angular momentum in x, in y, in z, the square of each, and the sum over all of them. Okay, so uh, the second part of this, I'll call that b, is about that. So essentially what it is asking us to prove is that m squared and mz commutes with each other because again we said that uh, the the commutation uh, of two operators basically mean that if they if the order in which these two operators are applied does not change the result then they are set to commute so you see these two this equality means that m squared and mz commute with each other or you can write that as m squared mz commutator which is defined as m squared mz minus mz m squared is equal to zero so if the commutator is equal to zero then they are then the first equality is right so we're trying to we're trying to prove this so if you want to prove that, you can basically just follow the same strategy as we have in the earlier part. Put in all the definitions with all the partial derivatives and you can just crank all the derivatives. Uh, however, there is actually a much easier way to do this, which is after we have the commutation relationship from the first part, we can actually write down the commutator between m squared and mz in a much more direct way. So let me explain what I mean by that. So really what we want to do is to calculate those two terms. So the first term, I'll just write m times m times mz. So even though I write these as times, they're really not. It's really like one, the MZ operator operating on F first, and then M second, and then another M after that. So, but um, the dot makes it a little bit um, easier to see. Uh, the um, the uh, definition of M squared, as we have seen, is MX squared plus M y squared plus m z squared so this is that and then after that m z okay so what we can then do is to write that as m x m x m z plus m y m y mz plus mz and we will just write a cube because it's basically three mz all together so we will leave that equation aside and we will work on the other one so that's this one 
And now we're going to write down the equation for that one. So that is mz, m, m, and that is mz, mx squared plus my squared plus mz squared, and that is mz, mx, mx plus m z m y m y plus m z cube so that's the the other expression so to make this clear i am going to use roman numeral 3 for that term and then roman numeral 4 for that term so clearly this is 4, and that is 3. So now you see that um, what I want to show is that 3 is equal to 4. So you see already there, there is a mz to the third power in the first one, and there is the same mz to the third power in the Roman numeral 4. So these two will cancel when I subtract one from the other. So that one, that one is taken care of. Now we want to show that, in fact, the rest of the terms between Roman numeral 3 and Roman numeral 4 are actually identical. But now you notice that the terms that appear in these two equations, they are similar, but they are not entirely identical. So what I mean is, for example, there is this term in Roman numeral 3, which looks like that term, not exactly the same, but similar. And there is also this term in Roman numeral 3, and that term in Roman numeral 4. So what we are going to try to do is to look at these terms that are similar and try to sort of see if they are actually related to each other. So let me take uh, this one first. Well, maybe I should use a different color. Let me take that one first, and I'm going to see if I can write down an equivalent expression for that. Let me mention that uh, while in part A, even though we've only worked out one of the commutators, so let me remind you what that is before we finally get to the end of this part. Uh, in part A, rep remember, we have proven that the commutator mx, my is equal to ih bar mz. While we haven't worked out the others, uh, we will. I will show you later on uh, quite easily. You can deduce that m y m z commutator must be equal to i h bar m x and similarly m z m x commutator must be equal to i h bar m y uh, those are the other results that the problem asks you to prove at the end but i'll get back to this uh, but i will have to use some of these results to complete part B of the problem. So again, remember what we want to do is to show that there is some relationship between this term and that term. And now I will use one of these commutators to try to illustrate that. And the one that I want to use is this one. So let me write down mz, mx, mx, and I will make use of that commutator to try to turn it into an expression that will relate to this one above. Okay, so let me first uh, group these together. So uh, what this is, is mz, mx. And so if I write out the expression for this commutator, the first term is mz, mx, minus mx, 
m z is equal to i h bar m y. So what I can see is that m z m x is, so I can move stuff around, so this is actually equal to this plus that. What is inside this set of parentheses, I can just replace that by the right side of that equation. So that will give me mx mz plus i h bar my, and that is all multiplied by mx. So now I can write everything out. So this would be mx mz mx plus i h bar m y m x and now i will put a pair of parentheses around that one and so i will again use the expression i have right here and insert it into there so that will give me m x m z plus i h bar m y and that gives me that and finally i can write out everything so this is m x m x m z oh i think i'm forgetting the last term so let me put that back in sorry uh i h bar m y m x Okay, so now writing everything out, I will have mx, mx, mz, plus i h bar, mx, my, and finally, I have another my, mx, so plus another i h bar, my, mx. Okay, so after using that commutator that we have from part A, we see that this term is just equal to that. Okay, so finally, we can put that back in. You see this term goes there. And so what we have is something like this. Now, we, if we compare that to the term we have in uh, Roman numeral 3, we see that there is an mx, mx, mz which is common with that term, mx, mx, mz. So if you take the difference between Roman numeral 3 and 4, that term will drop out. So the only term that remains is that one. Okay. So you kind of now know what is the strategy for the rest of the problem. Uh, so because you see that, there, is these two, there are these two terms which look like each other. And so if I do pretty much the same thing with that term, I should be able to see that they are similar uh, to the other, to the terms that we've just worked out. Okay, so we're just going to just finish that quickly. So again, I'm just going to write down the equation so that you see everything. And so in this case, we are going to pick this one to work on. So m y m y m z m y m y m z we are going to group that together and so you see uh, i can use the commutator to write m y m z is equal to m z m y plus i h m x so now you see that that becomes my, and then mz, my, plus i h bar, mx, expand, my, mz, my, plus i h bar, my, mx. So again, Using the relationship again to expand that, m y m z is equal to m z m y plus i h bar m x. That's in the parentheses. Another m y 
plus i h bar m y m x and so now you see that expanding everything i will have m z m y m y first term the second term is minus i h bar m x m y and then i also have another i h bar m y m x let me write that better okay so that is almost the end so you see that whichever we have in this term right here is just given by whichever we have right there so again this is a term from roman numeral three and so you see that the corresponding term in roman numeral four looks like that and there is a mz my my which matches this one mz my my so that term is going to cancel from uh, Roman numeral 3 and 4 and so the only term that's left is that one and now you see that these two terms uh, show up in here and also there and so they are also common between Roman numeral 3 and Roman numeral 4 so as a result of that we see exactly every term cancels and um, at the end you will see that uh, these two uh, these two operators, m squared and mz, uh, in fact, do commute. So that's the, that's the proof. So finally, at the end of the question, it asks you to basically prove exactly the same thing for the other coordinates. So, for example, in A, we have proven this, and we said that the rest of that problem in part a you have to basically prove the other commutator relationships and so uh, after you've proof, proven one you can prove all the others by repeating everything but by now you've seen that there are enough derivatives you probably don't want to repeat everything so how do you how can you show that the relationships are all correct so here we have these relationships and then you want to show that that is also true between not just x, y, but y, z, and z, x. So what you want to do is to really think of it a slightly different way. So here's a trick that is really useful to try to understand. So you see in three-dimensional space, the three dimensions or the three vectors x, y, z would span the entire space. By that I mean every vector in the three-dimensional space can be written as a linear combination of x, y, and z. So you see the vector, the unit vector x, y, and z represents essentially the three axes that you need in order to span the entire space. Now we usually go by a right-handed coordinate system and in fact all of these work out um, with the assumption that this is a right-handed coordinate system by a right-handed coordinate system what we mean is if we cross x and y by crossing i mean getting the cross product of x and y if we cross x and y we should get uh, z so basically if you take these two and you cross them you should get z and you see that that is right on the other hand if you cross if you just continue that logic if you cross y and z you should get x and finally if you cross z and x then you should get y so z and x you should get y so that's what it's meant by a right-handed coordinate system so basically x y gives z crossing y z gives x and crossing z x gives y now what you can do is to just give a generic label to these unit vectors and oftentimes you use i j k so let's imagine that the three unit vectors are called i j k rather than x y z 
Now, so you can associate i, j, k with x, y, z. And that would be sort of the normal, normal way we think about it. But since it's arbitrary, what you call x, y, and z, as long as you maintain sort of the right-handedness of the coordinate system, you can also associate i, j, k, the three unit vectors in the right-handed coordinate system with x, z, with y, z, and x. That would not have changed anything because um, x, y, z, X, Y, Z are just really names you assign to the unit vectors, right? You can call them anything, apple, oranges, it's just a name. So I, J, K, you could actually make the association between them to Y, Z, and X instead of X, Y, and Z. Or you can also associate I, J, K with Z, X, and Y so these are equally good. Basically, we are maintaining the fact that every one of these three associations is a, uh, maintains a right-handed coordinate system, and it doesn't really matter which name you call it. So what that means is, if you think about it that way, then you can easily see that, for example, in part A, the first relationship that we proved was the commutator between mx and m y is equal to i h m z. So if you think about it this way, then in the other association that you could make, you can see that you can just take the first two coordinates and you can just write m x m z commutator must be equal to i h m x. And finally, using the third one, you can see mz, mx commutator must be equal to i h bar m y. So you see that once you have proven one of them, namely the first one, the other two are trivial because it's just basically a renaming of the three axes in the right-handed coordinate system. So you automatically get the other to commutate a relationship very easily. And so finally, in part B, we have proven a different relationship, which is the commutator between m squared and mz is equal to zero. And from that, you can easily see that because mz isn't special because it's just a name any one of the three, x, y, or z, is going to obey the same relationship because m squared does not pay any attention to which one is called x, y, z. So you can easily see that by using the same argument, understanding the way the three axes are labeled actually make no material difference to these relationships. I can easily see that these two are also true. So, so the results in part A are pretty easy after you've proven the first one, and the rest of the results in part B are also pretty easy after you have proven the first relationship. Okay, so before I stop, just one final point. So I, uh, this, is a, this is a fairly long problem. The reason why you really want to go through this is to really understand that this is what it takes to really do some of the tedious arithmetic. And it's not difficult, it's just that you have to spend some time making sure that you keep track of everything so that you don't miss anything. Finally, one last point which is important is that the reason why you, um, the reason why these commutator relationships between the angular momentum operators are key to understanding quantum mechanics is because the quantum, the angular momentum operators will show up repeatedly in quantum mechanics, one. And second of all, these commutator relationships, as we have said, when two operators representing two different measurements commute, that means in quantum mechanics, you can measure both properties simultaneously on the same quantum system. Whereas if two operators do not commute, the two measurements represented by them cannot be made simultaneously on the same system. So you now notice that 
MX, MY, MY, MZ, and MZ, MX do not commute, which means that you cannot measure the three angular momentum in the X, Y, Z direction simultaneously. The only thing you can measure, though, simultaneously is that you can measure the M squared, which is the total magnitude of the angular momentum squared. At the same time, you measure MX or MY or MZ because each one of these this one, this one, this one, they do commute. So while you cannot measure the XYZ components of the angular momentums individually or simultaneously, you can measure any one of these three components together with the square of the magnitude of the total angular momentum of the particle. So that, that will uh, turn out to be an important uh, point when we study uh, atoms and molecules uh, in the future. Okay, so this is the end of this problem. And if you have enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more content on quantum chemistry on our channel, please do subscribe to our channel.